Okay. So that's conservation of linear momentum. We'll come back to that in just a second. So we, we know that the principal stresses and principal directions are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the stress tensor. We talked about that. We know how to solve for eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But let's talk about, you know, ultimately we're interested in, this is reservoir geomechanics, so we want to solve mechanics problems in the earth. And so let's learn what the principal stresses and directions are in the earth. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to take what I'm going to call a half space. Right? So sort of just a semi-infinite chunk of the Earth here. Right? And I'm going to stick a coordinate system on it. Right? I'm, a, I'm the modeler. I can choose to put the coordinate system wherever I want and however I want. So in this case, I'm going to stick a coordinate system on it. And the coordinate system is going to have one component that's straight down, so from the surface pointing at the center of the Earth. And we're going to, you know, our, co our coordinate system has to be orthogonal, so it doesn't really matter yet what the other directions are, but they're in the plane of the surface of the Earth. Right? We'll just call those x1, x2, x3. And it looks something like that, right? So this is that idealized half space. x3 is pointed down. It's a right-handed coordinate system. Always use right-handed coordinate systems. I, I've even been in professor's talks before, and they have left-handed coordinate systems on the slides. It drives me crazy. So you know what I mean by right-handed coordinate system? You don't remember that from mechanics? OK. So uh, stick your left hand in your pocket. Never use it, right? And then so always use your right hand, OK? And a right-handed coordinate system obeys the proper sort of cross-product rules, right? And so, if I stick my, th or you know, if I if I stick my fingers in the x1 direction, and I close my hand, right? So I basically I'm curling my fingers from x1 to x2. That's like taking the cross-product x1 x2. It should give me x3. My thumb should be pointing in the x3 direction. Right? So if I put my fingers in the x1 direction and close my hand, curling it to the x2, my thumb should be in the x3 direction. That's a right-handed coordinate system. Right. Had, I, had I drawn the x2 the other way, then it would be wrong. Right? x1 cross x2, if x2 was pointing out here, my thumb would be pointing up, which would indicate a negative you know, cross product. And that's, that's not correct. So we're going to, that, that right-handed rule will come up quite a few times in this class, so it's, it's sort of just as a convenience. OK. So we have this idealized half space. And remember, I, I pulled this out of the surface of the Earth. And the surface, the, the surface there is in contact with a fluid, right? Over the entire surface of the Earth, the top is in contact with a fluid. What are the flu what's the fluid? Air or water. Okay. So everywhere, the surface of the Earth is in contact with a fluid, and fluids cannot transmit. Well, it, it, it's a fine engineering assumption at this scale to say that fluids cannot transmit shear stress. Right. So that's not to say that you know. If you're on the surface of the Earth and the wind's blowing 100 miles an hour, there's some boundary layer there generating some shear stress, but that's not going to cause tectonic motion, right? So there, you know, what we're interested in here is the motion of the of the plates, and there's no fluid. And air and water will not impose enough shear stress anywhere on the Earth to cause the plates to move, right? and so effectively they're zero in any scenario. 
And so if I were to take my little idealized cube, where this time my cube is perfectly in, the top of my cube is perfectly uh, in line with the top of the surface of the earth that I've drawn here, and I were to pull it out and draw my stress components on the top there, so this is S33, and then in the way that I've drawn this, <coughs> this would be S32, S31. So I've drawn it with the opposite sign convention that we derived it the other day. And I should have pointed that out. I think when I drew, when I drew like that initial sort of potato schematic of the, of the piece of the crust we pulled out to draw our free body diagram, I think I drew the, the, um, the traction vectors in compression. And then when I pulled out my little cube, I drew them in tension. Right? That's just a sign convenience because it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. In all of the mechanics, aside from sort of petroleum or geomechanics, geomechanics, it's typical to see that a tension positive sign convention. Right? So on, on our little cube, positive would be the vectors pointing out from the cube. Right? So if you work on airplanes or cars or anything else, that's going to be the typical sign convention. But in geomechanics, uh, it's more common to use a compressive sign convention because all the stresses in the earth are essentially compressive for a couple of reasons. You know, one is if they were tensile, if, if, there were, if there were, you know, rock is fairly brittle material in tension, right? So if you had tensile stresses in the earth, you'd just be failing rock everywhere all the time. Uh, the other reason is uh, most of the earth below the water table, you know, below, below a few meters down, is fluid saturated, right? I mean, that is associated pressure associated with the flu fluid in there. You guys know that from, from you know, reservoir engineering. We'll also learn how to compute that in this class, you know, remember how to do it. But, uh, you know, that fluid pressure, if uh, if there wasn't some confining pressure on the Earth, comp compressive stresses, that fluid pressure would just hydraulically fracture the rock everywhere. Right? So for those two reasons, we sort of know intuitively that there has to be compressive stresses in the, in the Earth. And because we don't want to carry negative signs around with us everywhere, we're just going to choose our sign convention to be compression positive. Okay? And so in a compression positive sign convention, my little stress, the, the vectors I would draw in the stress cube are as I've drawn them there, okay? Now, I just told you uh, fluids can't transmit, you know, the, we're going to work with the engineering assumption that fluids don't transmit shear stresses, okay? And I pulled out this cube from the top of the earth, and because the whole thing is in equi equilibrium, if there's no shear stress in the air or the water, then there's no shear stress on the surface of the earth, right? And so therefore, S32 and S31 are zero. And then, <coughs> because of angular momentum we talked about, the stress tensor is symmetric, therefore S23 and S13 are also zero. So therefore, these guys are all zero. And so if you look at the last equation, or you know, if you look at look at the equation, there's there's only one term that has a three in it left. S33. Now we have to have, you know, we have to have the principal stresses are orthogonal. And there's no way I could draw an orthogonal coordinate system without some component of S33, right? So another reason to use your right hand is you can, you know, this is a perfect right hand coordinate system made with these three fingers, right? 
So there's no way I can orient my hands in any way that I won't have some component of S3 3, or S3, uh, right, in the X3 direction. <coughs> and since the only non-zero component is S3 3, then S3 3 must be a principal stress. It has to be, right? Because it's the only stress in the three direction. And we know our principal stress is orthogonal to each other. So S3 3 is a principal stress. And the other two, because it's an orthogonal coordinate system, that means the other two principal stresses are in the plane of the Earth. Right? We just don't, we don't know the direction yet, but we know they're in the plane of the Earth somehow. So, I mean, as an aside, we'll see this again later. Uh, well, I, I guess I should have said also, you know, we're talking about stresses that arise from tectonic motion. Tectonic motion is very slow. And so because it's slow, we typically, as a good approximation, can ignore the inertia terms. We talk about quasi-static, right? So the motion of the tectonic plates occurs over such long periods of time that it's effectively a static motion. And so we assume that these guys are zero. Of course, if you're doing earthquake engineering or something like that, you can't, you can't assume that because you have to deal with, you have to understand the wave propagation. Okay, so but then, then what's left there gives us, the equation that's left gives us a way to sort of, you know, we have S33 is equal to X3. I'll go ahead and rearrange it. <coughs> All right. And of course, if we assume that the body force in the, Z in the three direction is actually gravity, right? let me write it like that, then we can separate and integrate both sides of the equation. So then we have S33 is equal to the integral um, that where assuming that at x3 equals 0 there's no stress so that gives us a way to actually compute s33 so what we just showed there, and, and by the way, the arguments we made were at the surface of the Earth, but we can, you can also show that, uh, you know, basically th th that holds from the surface of the Earth down to the brittle ductile transition, that S33 is equal to what we'll, we'll see. It's a principal stress, and we'll identify it by SV, so S vertical, right? S vertical is a principal stress. <coughs> 